you. First of all, a big thank you to Maria for the very kind introduction and uh, to all our friends from Gantt for arranging this amazing venue for the, uh, for the talk. And especially big thank you for you guys for getting up so early on a Friday morning and coming to this. So thank you very much indeed. Um, my name is Tim and um, as Maria mentioned, I'm, I'm from a company based in Hong Kong um, called Escal. Um, if I could just maybe start, with, give you a little bit of an idea about what we do and then move into the actual uh, theme of the, uh, of the sharing. So the, the title uh, of today's sharing is Making a Difference. Um, we actually make shirts. We're a so-called vertical manufacturer of, of shirts. We plant a cotton seed, we grow the cotton, and we end up by delivering a shirt. And I'd like to try and build a bridge between apparel and the environment specifically. Um, to the company, um, we are Hong Kong based, we're family owned, we're girl power, we're owned by two ladies. Um, about 64% of our staff are also ladies. Uh, we're 57,000 people. Um, we're 100% family owned. Um, we were founded 40 years ago, and as I mentioned, we start with a cotton seed and finish delivering a, a product. Um, we make a, a about 120 million of these a year shirts, and we really are enormously proud to be able to work together with Gantt because, not least of all, not, not least of all great people, but we share very, very similar values. So, um, what's our operation, as I mentioned, we start with this small plant and we end up by delivering the shirt to uh, customers such as, as Gantt. And if I may, with a visual, just give you a feeling about where the journey starts and, and where it finishes. So that's just a little bit of background as to where we come from, what we do. Um, I think everybody recognises this big, beautiful blue planet that we call home. Um, and John F. Kennedy uh, said, supreme reality of our time is the vulnerability of our planet. Um, you know, that's very real today, but the fact is that he said this in 1963. So you know, 56 years ago, JFK, you know, obviously realised, and the people who advised him, that we were in a very precarious position. And even though we look, if we look at our planet, you know, look at the people on it, we've probably never been so powerful, our knowledge and what we can do, both for good and unfortunately bad. But at the same time, we've probably never been as vulnerable as we are today. So if I may just start, the water that we drink, I mean, probably our most important resource, all the ladies in the room, um, about 55% of what you are is water. The guys, for some reason, 60% of what we are is water. Your kids, when they're born, 70% is water. So it's obviously a very, very necessary thing to keep us alive on the planet. Now, we take water a little bit for granted. Um, 
So if we look at the water on the blue planet, there's 97%, which is the sea, the oceans, which gives us the blue color. Um, two and a half percent is frozen, so the uh, Arctic and the Antarctic, although unfortunately that's melting at a horrendous rate. And only 5% is fresh water that we can actually drink. Um, the biggest part of that is subterranean, i.e. we get it from the ground and then we have the, the lakes, we have the rivers, etc. But 0.5% is the water that we can actually drink to stay alive here. Um, over the years, particularly since the Industrial Revolution started, we've done some pretty horrendous things to the water that we need to live. Uh, you know, dumping all sorts of terrible things in the rivers and the systems, uh, killing the ecosystems, you know. This obviously is something that we really, really, really want to not see in the future, that there are warnings about the, the danger of drinking or washing in this amazing sweet water resource. Then we move on to the air, you know, we'll die without the water and absolutely for sure we'll die without the air. But similarly, you know, again since industrialization started, uh, we've done some pretty awful things to the quality of the air. You know, these are typical scenes not only in China but many big cities around the world. You guys, I think, are very, very fortunate you not only live in this beautiful country, you have great air, you have great water, but these are not untypical scenes. You know, if you go to Beijing, Shanghai, New York, warnings. Um, and specifically, you know, because we are textile, because Gantt is apparel, uh, the industry has gained, um, not without um, reason, uh, not a particularly good image over the last uh, 30, 40, 50 years. However, you know, we, we've worked very hard, we're getting it on track, where the, the industry is being cleaned up, but nonetheless, there are still black sheep. You know, the black sheep, in this metaphoric uh, instance, you know, we need to clean up, get rid of the black sheep, clean up the industry. Um, we, you know, we talk about cleaning up, we talk about the vulnerability on the planet, um, and th this guy, um, Chief Seal, uh, after which uh, Seattle is actually named, um, he, he, he said this, and you know, well, well, well over 150 years ago, humankind has not woven the web of life, but we're one thread within it. Uh, whatever we do to the, the web, we do to ourselves. Um, all things are bound together, all things are connected. You know, this is, it was true then, and it's never been more true than today. Um, sustainability. This has become a little bit of a byword in recent years. Um, it shouldn't be, you know, anything that we do uh, on the planet, in our business, the way we live, sustainability is intrinsic to surviving on this planet. You know, the ability to endure, to adapt and to develop, very, very, very important to continuing to live on this planet. And getting that right is the only way that we're going to ensure survival. So, very, very simply, sustainability really does equal survival on, on this beautiful blue planet on which we live. This may seem a little bit abstract, but I'd like to take it a little bit off the main track and a reality check. Um, we talk about all sorts of things on the planet that are to do with sustainability. One thing that we don't really talk about too much, and we should talk a lot more about, is the population growth. So if we, these, these are UN figures. If we, if we take a look here back in 2000, let's go to where we are now. Um, in November last year, we crossed the 7.5 billion mark. Um, it's anticipated by, by 2030, which is only 11 years away. You know, it sounds a long way away, but it's 11 years. Um, we're gonna be 8.2 billion. If we look here, we're going to be almost 9.2 billion in 2050. <laughs> By the turn of the century, it's estimated we're going to be 11.2 billion. So 7.5 today, we're going to be 11.2 by the end of the century. And I certainly won't be here, but maybe, you know, kids, grandchildren will be. Take a look at this one. I mean, this is kind of scary. Um, we, we look at the pre-industrial uh, period and world population remained reasonably flat. 
But then we got into the industrial period, you know, particularly 17, 1800s, and we start to see this uh, disproportionate growth of population on the planet. Um, this actually only takes it up to 10 billion, but um, more recent estimates put the population in 2100 to 11.2 uh, billion. That in itself is kind of scary, but if we take a look at this, this is kind of related to us staying alive on the planet, but it's also a little bit related to our, you know, our business, the ability to produce garments, and not least of all, food. So if we're looking here up to just 2050, we're going to see about a 30% growth of population. At the same time, we're losing arable land. This is primarily through desertification, urbanization. Um, but when we look here, the food that we're going to need to feed those additional 30% of people, it's going to go up by 85%. You may think, well, you know, how does that work? 30% more people need 85% more food. Of course, the people in the chain who have more money, the growing middle class, etc., etc., they, they're not happy with a bowl of rice every day or a piece of bread or whatever. They're eating more, they're eating better. Um, but the, the food requirements are going to go up by 85%. Textile fibres, which of course to us is kind of important, um, about 95, 94% of what we do is cotton. So textile fibres, uh, the requirement, whether it's cotton, whether it's viscose, whether it's wool, it doesn't matter. The requirement is also going to go up enormously, disproportionately, 112%. And again, similar to food, the reason for this is that as the middle class grows, people, you know, they, instead of having a, a shirt or two in the cupboard, they may have 20 shirts. So we're going to need a lot more fibres. Um, this population growth, 50% uh, by 2050 uh, of the world, 50% will be in those countries. The ones I've highlighted in red are kind of significant to us because they are very important cotton growing areas. What this means, of course, is that we will have cotton competing with food, or vice versa. You can do a lot of things with cotton, but you can't eat it. So in the areas where our natural fibre comes from, there will be much, much more food being um, produced. So we then come to this kind of, in, in, it's an important um, situation. Food is challenged with fibre, fibre is challenged with food. Um, if we go back to 1950, or, yeah, here, we had about just under half a hectare of land per head of humanity to grow food. Um, if we then look at, within, you know, one short lifespan, um, up to where we are here, where the little dot is, that's halved. We're now at 0.2 of a hectare. Now, of course, one of the reasons is there are more people on the planet. The other, as I mentioned before, is that we have less agricultural land available. Um, some of the scariest data is also from the UN. And in the last uh, three years, we've been losing, on average, 1.5% of agricultural land per year. Now, that's really scary, you know, if you project that forward. Um, this has to stop. We have to change it. We, all of us. As I mentioned, urbanisation is certainly one of the reasons that, um, uh, that agricultural land is disappearing. Cities get bigger, industrial zones grow, commercial areas. Desertification. Um, we grow our cotton um, in, a, in an area of China in the northwest called Xinjiang province, which um, borders on the Gobi Desert. And the mechanics of the desert getting bigger, it doesn't matter whether it's the Gobi Desert, the Sahara, the Kalahari, the, the reasoning is the same, but particularly as climate gets drier in these areas, topsoil dries and, and blows away, which is ideal for the, the desert to be able to encroach on land. So the deserts are actually taking agricultural land away. We try and combat it by planting deep-rooted trees, even poplar trees, very tall, to stop the wind, stop it blowing away the topsoil. Nonetheless, we can see this horror um, of, the, of the deserts growing and taking good arable land. 
Um, in the 1940s, there was a guy called Stephen Palmer, and uh, he was very interested in data mapping, um, all sorts of things, but one thing that um, has stuck and is very relevant today, he data mapped drought trends. Now, um, sorry, it's, it's not as complicated as it looks, but this is the incidence of drought, that's the, uh, the red line. And uh, you know, I, was, I, I was born in 57, which is about here. And if we follow this through, you know, here we are in the 2019, around here. And if we look at 2100 here, there's absolutely a clear story. Drought has not only increased in the last 60 years, uh, the tendency is that drought is going to continue. So, you know, we talk about global warming, which sort of rolls off the lips really easily. But, you know, this is a very clear result of part of global warming. Um, we talked about the resources or the, the reserves of, of, um, of sweet water, water that we can drink. Um, subterranean, yes, lakes, seas. So if you look here, these are some satellite images of the Aral Sea, um, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, border it. Now, I think it's pretty clear to see that, you know, in the 70s, it, it looked like a sea. How, how big is this, by the way? This is about 300 kilometers. You know, so it's a serious piece of water. Um, but as we can see, 86, 99, going all the way through, the Aral Sea has all but disappeared. All but disappeared. You know, so there's a you know, ship with nowhere to go. Um, let's just move continent. Let's go to Africa. So uh, in Africa, you know, you've got one or two very large lakes. Uh, one of them, uh, Lake Victoria, the other Lake Chad. Um, Lake Chad is a similar situation. You know, here we have, again, satellite imagery. Um, 73, you know, pretty extensive piece of water. And again, this, this is from here to here is about 200 kilometers. So, you know, serious amount of water. And we look at it, uh, this uh, latter one here is 2013. And this was last year. So, you know, Lake Chad is little more than a, yeah, a sub-Saharan swamp. Um, on the other hand, you know, we, we see that drought is increasing. On the other hand, the opposite of drought is flooding. So the flooding is, is exponentially increasing. Again, data starting in the 50s. And we can see on, on all the continents um, the incidence of, of flooding. So we've got areas of the world where there's far too little water, and then we have other areas of the world where there's far too much. You know, both are not great situations. Um, but as you can see, the, the tendency is absolutely horrendous. Um, making a difference, which you know, is, is the theme of the, the sharing this morning. Um, there's all sorts of stuff that we can do. Uh, and when I say we, I really do mean we. It's not about, you know, it's not about the, 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 the brands or the, the manufacturers. It, it's about behavior, human behavior. Um, we, as I mentioned, we, we grow cotton. We grow about 82,000 tonnes of cotton a year, which we need to make, to make these shirts. We don't get very much of it back. You know, what you wear here, most of it, not in Sweden, because I understand in Sweden you don't have landfill, you, you burn your refuse. But in the, in the world, globally, 84% of what the people are wearing will end up in landfill. This is a resource, we need to win it back. So recycling, very, very big uh, issue. It's not only glass or metal or you know, things that we put in our, our trash cans, it's also about garments, getting back the fibers. So as I mentioned, you know, this is very, very, very sadly, in 84, 80 plus percent of the cases, this is where the garments end up. Just a couple of examples. This is you know, one country and, and uh, one uh, city. But uh, you know, New, New York, 182,000 tonnes of apparel 
a year just for one city end up in the ground. UK, uh, where I come from, 235 million items of clothing a year just going into rubbish dumps. It's, it's, it's perverse. Um, so I think these are the kind of things that not only with you know, resources, important resources, you know, such as food and metals and glass and all the rest of it, we have to look more at uh, recycling, reduction, recycling and renew. Getting back these garments, getting them back into the loop, getting them back into the system. This is really key. And it's a behavioural thing, you know, not throw away. But we have to collect, we have to reuse. Um, we have the technology in, 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 in the company, in the industry, uh, to break down garments. We, we, we can break them down, we can turn them back into fibre. Albeit the fibre isn't the, the same quality as the virgin fibre that we grow, but we can get it back. So there is the technology, there's nothing in the way there, compact waste. Um, we, we make the shirts, we, don't, we, we sell them to the brands, but we don't sell them to you. So the waste that we produce whilst we're making the shirt, whether it's in spinning, carding, combing, weaving, cutting, we, we can collect this. Um, we collect about 20 tonnes a month which we do recycle, which we do use. However, this is a real drop in the ocean. It's, it's minute, it's nothing. But we can use our own waste. The key thing is being able to get back what you regard as waste. When you've finished with that, that shirt, you know, how can we get it back? This is really, really key. This has already started. Again, I think you guys in, in Sweden, Scandinavia generally, you know, the closing the loop, collecting garments is a little bit more normal, a little bit more natural than in some other areas of the world. But this has to become, you know, as, as much as you will go into a store and, and buy goods, you should be going, or not you specifically, but one should be going into the store to return these garments. There are many, many positive aspects about it. I mean, one of them, of course, is waste pollution. We reduce that. The other is water consumption. We don't need the, the water to, to, to grow the crop. We don't need the water to finish, to produce the garment. Um, CO2 footprint, of course, is, is favor favorably influenced. And the use of pesticides, not only pesticides, fertilizers, herbicides, etc., etc. So a lot of positive impacts of reusing the fiber. And we need to look at this you know, used garment, not as waste, but we need to look at it as a resource. So, just a, a few examples, but, you know, there's so much that you can do with it. Um, as I mentioned, the, the, the quality of the fibre is not quite as good as, as uh, in virgin fibre. However, you can blend it with virgin fibre. So, you know, with, with certain brands, we're we're blending, excuse me, <coughs> we're blending the cotton and making a new garment. If you go into an Apple store around the world, um, we make all the tops for, for Apple. And uh, Apple are very, very interested also to use sustainable products. So we're putting a lot of recycled cotton into those tops. Cathay, which is our you know, local airline in Hong Kong, like you have SAS, um, we, we make the uniforms, we also take them back, we recycle them, and, and the recycled cotton goes partly into the uniform, but also into the airline blankets. So, excuse me. So, <clears throat> in this case, we really have closed the loop. So, there's a lot more that we can do in this direction. Um, sustainable new... Um, not new but sustainable fibres you know we have to also look at this we have to weigh up you know are they grown in the, from the ground is it a plant is it a vegetable is it an animal um, so we're, we're starting to blend much more uh, with for instance the the yak uh, linen silk tensile which is a modified viscose um, these are certainly more sustainable than cotton on its own 
Um, I'd like to just show you these two young, young ladies and, and just explain uh, why. So, Abby, Abby and uh, Mali. DKMY, call it Dinigan, Louis Vuitton, and my favorite, Mark Jacobs. I buy all my clothes online from my iPad too. They look so good on the big screen. People ask me about bricks and mortar stuff, but I can't find their website. Anyway, I digress. I'm here to inform me that we fashionistas of the future all want a great customer experience. It's multi-channel online engagement that anticipates what we want and when we want it. They should also be in dot site, smile app, and live real-time shop assistants. Ways to help us when we get there. I'm in a constant state of information overload. So my friends are my most valuable asset. Before we start shopping, we read their recommendations, reviews, blogs, tweets, and Facebook updates to find out what's hot right now. So if I want to know if the latest Prada dress looks better in pink or purple, I just social search what my friends like. Finally, when will you fashion people get with the program? The net is about personalization. I should be able to collaborate directly with designers to create an outfit especially for me. Now, totally be the coolest chicken ray one. Now, I know you're all working on this, but I'm a digital native and I want it now. Hurry up so, and get cracking. You know, what, what, what Abby and Marley are talking about is kind of completely normal. You know, they're going to be the consumers of the future. What we're talking about, I think, is more behaviour. So it's about how we consume, it's about what we consume, it's about what we do with it when we finish the consumption. And uh, this is, I think, part of the education that we, all of us, we need to spread to the next generation, we need to discuss together. It's not about stopping consumption, otherwise the world stops. Um, but we have to consume and recycle more responsibly. Um, Vivian Westwood, who some of you may, may know, the sort of grand dame of punk and fashion, uh, you know, she, she summed it up in that, buy less, choose well, make it last. You know, I think that probably sums up a, a, a very good attitude in, in behaviour when it comes to this fashion. Um, I'd like to move on now just a little bit, you know, I, I can't speak about the industry, I can't speak about other industries, I can only really speak about what we are doing. Um, our, our company was established 40 years ago and sustainability hasn't just arrived. You know, we've been practicing sustainability for almost 40 years. So let's look, the liquid of life, the water that we know, well, that we need to survive. Well, guess what? Cotton needs it, unfortunately, in enormous quantities. Um, the virgin cotton, so if we're growing it, um, obviously it has to be irrigated, it has to be watered. Otherwise, as with any plant, it, it will die. So, in a lot of countries around the world, surface irrigation and sprinkler irrigation is practiced. Very, very, very poor irrigation. 45% crop uh, penetration. That means that, obviously, 55% goes somewhere else. 41% of that is evaporation, and 14% is runoff. It just ends up, you know, running into, into the rivers or, or, or whatever. So, not very not very practical. This way, and, and, and this is, it may scare you or you may know it or, or not, but um, up to 22,000 litres of water for one kilo of cotton irrigating this way. Um, we grow our own cotton. These are our cotton fields and we practice what's called drip irrigation. Still sounds a lot. We need 5,700 litres per kilo. However, you know, it's a dam site better than the 20,000 litres plus. So drip irrigation, so we are saving water in this sense. Um, manufacturing. Um, there are many, many things that you can do. The dyeing, um, low liquor ratio, dyeing, um, pressure dyeing, etc. 
getting the amount of water that we need to dye to put the colours on reduction. Um, sizing, the sizing liquors, recycling them, uh, using them, using also the waste, turning them into briquettes. Um, also the finishing, uh, very um, water and power intensive. Um, a lot of development here that we're able to get the power and the water uh, consumption down significantly. Garment washing. Um, traditionally, you know, most of the garments you wear at some stage will have been washed and uh, traditional process per cycle using about a thousand litres of water. Um, these uh, pieces of equipment here, that's down to 40 litres of water, so 1,000 down to 40. Uh, ozone wash, as you can imagine, there's actually no water involved. Um, you know, this may sound criminal, or it may not sound criminal, but we take uh, very large amounts of water from um, the rivers. Uh, one of our locations alone, we take about 38,000 tonnes of water per day from a relatively dirty river, the Pearl River, in the south of China. However, we purify that and we return it after we've used it to the rivers in drinking water quality. I'm not saying for one minute that we can clean up the Pearl River. However, if we can set an example, if more industries, more companies will follow this, we could very quickly clean up systems, river systems, ecosystems. This is just the purification. Water consumption, um, you know, I'm not only talking generally about water on the planet, but what, what we as a company can do. So, you know, in the last 12 years, we've managed to reduce our water consumption in producing this by 67%. Um, energy, of course, very important for producing anything. Um, looking at the technology, um, bringing down the consumption of power that is needed to, to drive the machinery, the equipment that we use, very, very key. Um, and why is it key? It's key because um, with using the right technology, with staying abreast, with developing uh, technology for the manufacturing, also very, very significant um, savings in energy. So we've reduced by about half. Um, exhaust gases, I won't bore you with this, but it's very important, obviously, to have the, uh, the, the air, the clean air that we want to have, that the exhaust gases are reduced, brought down to an absolute minimum. The final part I'd like to get onto is where and how and in what you manufacture. So, um, you know, many people think perhaps of dark satanic mills producing garments wherever they may be. No, you know, these are, this is our most recent manufacturing unit in, in Guilin, in, in Guangxi province in China. A very green factory. Um, it's, it's almost finished. It will become operational in, uh, in April this year. Um, but it's a zero um, discharge factory, so there is nothing, apart from human effluent, which, okay, is unavoidable, but there is nothing industrial that comes out of this factory. It is zero discharge. sort of tiny aspects, not only the zero discharge and the energy and so on, but, you know, even building the place, um, it was very much a, a target for us that we didn't want to be importing building materials from all over the world or even all over China. So 65% of the materials that went into this building came from a radius of 100 kilometres around the factory. Also, a, you know, very small, but a, a contribution towards the sustainable factory. 
So just one or two images of the place. And it's not, not only that it should be a green factory, it should also be a place that people would like to work. So making a, fa a factory um, attractive as a, as, a, as a workplace. And then this is, if you don't mind me talking through it, um, this is uh, the, the, the next step in the industrial development of our industry. Many of the garments that you're wearing have been transported halfway around the world. And this, going forward, is, is not a, a sustainable option. Um, what we would like to see here is that we not only optimise the way that we produce the garment, with robotics and automation, we should be able to produce effectively much closer to market, which I think in the future is going to be a, a very, very important aspect of all manufacturing. We're already used to understanding that, you know, it's not sensible to be eating strawberries in December. Strawberries won't grow here in December. They're coming, I don't know, from Israel or Brazil or wherever they come from. But equally, um, you know, it's not sensible to be dragging a garment halfway around the world. Not only dragging it halfway around the world, perhaps even sending it back to the other side of the world to sell it. So, you know, before you even unpack a blouse or a shirt, it might have traveled 20,000 kilometers on a boat burning crude oil. You know, these are all, they're all small aspects of sustainability, but they are aspects. You know, I don't think there's any one thing that we can do to make the planet more sustainable or make an industry more sustainable. It's a sum of many, many small things. Um, this is a, it's called the Integral Conversation. We, we hold it once a year in uh, Guilin in China. Um, you're very welcome to visit if you ever happen to be in the area, but it's a, it's a sustainability forum. Um, it's, it's not about Escal, it's about bringing people of disciplines from different industries together to exchange. Um, so genuinely, you know, our friends at Gantt know that they're always welcome, and you guys also, uh, you know, if you ever happen to be in the area, please come. It's a very, very interesting uh, sustainability forum have kind of interesting speakers each year uh, who, you know, are at the forefront of um, sustainable policy, manufacturing, politics, um, interesting people. We also uh, have a, an annual sustainability report similar to, uh, similar to Gantt. Um, you know, you as perhaps consumers of our product you're able to go online and see exactly where the product's coming from, how it's made, what the impacts are. So, you know, if you ever wish to Google us, you'll come up with the sustainability report, take a look at it. Um, increased awareness. Uh, we have eco buses in the countries that we produce. Of course, it, we can discuss, we're adults, but I think we need to instill awareness about behaviour, about all these subjects in kids. So um, this is one way of doing it, sending the eco buses to primary schools, etc. And it's, we get back to the beginning where we started about making a difference. This is what we are trying to do, what you're trying to do, what we need to instill in the next generation. We have to make a difference. If we don't, we're going to have serious, serious problems on this big, beautiful blue planet that we call home. And we talk about future. Um, you know, the future is actually now. It, the, the clock is ticking because you know, what we do today is, is going to intrinsically influence for better or for worse, but let's hope for better the future. So the future is now. So uh, that's the, the, the end of my sharing. I'm sorry it leapt a little bit all over the place, but... Um, uh, all, all the things that I've tried to touch on have in some way, shape or form a relevance to our overall um, sustainability 
effort that we're sharing, that we need to share, we need to be more aware of together on this planet. So thank you very much for listening and thank you for being here. Thank you.